Um, I am Deanna Woolard. I'm from Randolph-Macon College, and I'm delighted to be chairing the demo share session. Uh, so we have nine demos over the next 45 minutes. Each demo is going to be about five minutes long, and um, we have some very exciting things to see. We're going to start off today uh, with Tatsum. Um, he is going to uh, do our first demo. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me okay? So the volume yes. is not too small or anything? Okay, good. So I'd like to talk about a very simple demo that uh, I do in my class when I teach the variational method. Because, uh, you know, the variational method is very mathematic and it's always a good idea to sort of show that uh, you can actually uh, do something useful with it. And, uh, and the problem is, you know, what is the shape of a hanging string? You take a piece of string, which has a uniform mass density, and you sort of hang it from two points. And the question is, what is the shape of that string? And this shape is what is known as the catenary. And it's basically a minimization problem with a constraint. What you do is uh, you can express the shape of the string as a function y of x, x being the horizontal axis and y being the vertical axis. And you, what you want to do is you want to minimize the total potential energy that the string has when it has a particular shape, subject to the constraint that the length of the string is unchanged. And so it's a minimization problem subject to a constraint. So you can use the Euler-Lagrange equation with the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, and the equation, when you do that, the equation you have to solve looks like this. It may look formidable, but uh, it's, it's not that bad. And I think it's something that uh, undergraduate students can handle. And if you solve it, you find that the function has to be a hyperbolic cosine. And in case people are not familiar with a hyperbolic cosine is, it's e to the kx plus e to the minus kx divided by two. And uh, so this is gonna be the solution. And uh, some students, when I show this to them, they get intimidated by the math. So let me show you a more simple way of getting the same result. <clears throat> You can draw a diagram of a string and you choose your coordinate axis so that the origin is at the lowest point of your string. And you look at the forces acting on a section of the string. And there's this uh, tension at the left end of the string, which is horizontal. There'll be tension at the right end of the string, which we point in the direction tangent to the shape of the string. And then there's the weight of the string between here and here. And these three forces have to cancel each other out. So that tells you what the slope of the function has to be at some particular point. Little x is equal to capital X. And, uh, and after a little bit of song and dance, again, you can easily derive the solution that the uh, function has to be a hyperbolic cosine. And there's a minus one here because I chose the coordinate system so that the lowest point of the function is at the origin but otherwise it's the exact same shape, okay? And I think this might be e easier for our students to tackle. So what does the hyperbolic cosine look like? Well, I've uh, plotted a bunch of graphs using Mathematica. So depending on uh, how taut your string is, uh, you can get one of these shapes. So let me actually Uh, show this to you, okay? I hope you can, let's see. Excuse me, I have to stop sharing. Ah. Okay, so I think you can now see me from standing in front of my screen and I have the graphs projected onto my screen. And I can take a piece of string and I can hold it against the graph, so I project it, and it's really easy to show that they follow the curve of the hyperbolic cosine exactly. And I'm letting it follow the red line now, or I can sort of let it sag a little bit more, and it will follow the purple line exactly. I could pull it uh, sideways a little bit more, and it will follow the blue line, orange line, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and I think this is a very simple demonstration that you can do 
to actually show that the, uh, the, the some complicated calculations are actually uh, useful. And that is it. Thank you much. Thank you, Tatsu. That was very interesting. We next have uh, Kervlin Doss from North Stanford High School. All right. Hello. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? Yes. All right. So my demo I'm going to show is talking about finding the speed of flight. So let me set up. So the speed of light or the speed of any electromagnetic, sorry about that, any electromagnetic wave is gonna be the wavelength times the frequency. Now, what I'm gonna to use to find this is your standard microwave oven. So uh, we got the frequency times the wavelength and you'll have to excuse my drawing. I lost my normal stylus, so I'm trying to make do. Uh, but the frequency um, you can find on the back of pretty much any microwave. Um, the one I happen to be using is, twenty four sixty megahertz, which mega is million twenty four sixty. So that's two point four six. times 10 to the ninth. All right, I'm gonna stop. Oh. Give me one moment. Apologize, I'm trying to-, to understand you much better if I can get familiar with the way you talk. I need your permission. Sorry about that. All right. So I've got the microwave here. And then as you all can see, I've got a plate of marshmallows. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to set these in the microwave for about 10 seconds or so. And because this microwave produces a standing wave, we can get a fairly accurate um, wavelength from that. Uh, um, so I found that this works really well with um, peeps because they you can kind of see pretty easily when they spread out uh, the little powdered sugar. Um, it's not so easy with marshmallows, but you can kind of feel around, um, well, you know, kind of mushy bits and hard uh, firmer bits with the marshmallows. Um, it's worth noting that you need to take the turntable out because that's what cooks the food evenly, right? We want the very clear nodes and anti-nodes. So I've got my marshmallows here. I think that is a spot there. I don't think you all can see what I'm doing that well, but hopefully I'm describing it well enough. Set it up about could you point the camera? Could you point the camera to your plate? Oh, there, there, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize. I've um got my Surface Pro in kind of the tablet mode, so I'm trying to hold the camera and hold the ruler and point something out with two hands. But you can feel around. Um, I think I've got a pretty clear bit there.
And again, I don't think you all can see the rule of that. So wavelength times the frequency, the wavelength. My makeshift stylus isn't working, but 0 0.06 meters. Frequency equals. megahertz. And if we type that into the calculator, get 2.46, 10 to the ninth. Um, times 0 0.06. Apologize again, my stylus. But we get about 1.47, which is a suspiciously wrong answer, right? Because that's right around half what we expect for the speed of light. And so this brings up a really good point that when we're looking at a standing wave, we've got two periods of intensity before we get the full wavelength, or the, a full wavelength is every other sort of period of intensity. So our wavelength stretches from one to the next, whereas when we made the measurement earlier, we were only taking one uh, bit of high intensity to the next. So it's not really six centimeters. We need to look for the second, uh, second point where the marshmallow's got mushy for the second point of high intensity. So in order to do the correct calculation, um, we would use 0.12 meters. Um, which gets us very close to the actual speed of light. That gets us 2.46 times 10 to the ninth. <coughs> so there we go. That's all I have. Um, again, sorry, the shifting back and forth wasn't in focus the best. But um, yeah, that's all I have. I look forward to trying it. Do you have your favorite peeps that you yeah. like to use in this demonstration? Yes. Well, so the bunnies look, tend to work better than the rat, uh, the than the ducks, just because you can lay them flat. Um, but yeah. Place. The other thing I wanted to point out is this is a good way to get the microwave into the classroom. I know those of you in high school, if you're like me, there's this whole fire code or whatever. Um, but it's a good way to say, hey, this is for science. Here's our microwave. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, let's bring our next um, individual who's going to come up and do a demo. And this is going to be Alex Barr from Howard Community College. Hi, everyone. Uh, so exciting to be able to still participate with the uh, Chesapeake section, even though I've moved to Texas now. So benefit of the, the virtual meeting here. Uh, let's see. 
trying to get, uh, make sure I can see myself here. Okay. So uh, I have a uh, quick- Before comment. you get started, uh, yeah. Carvelin, can you please unshare your screen? I'm, tr yes, I'm trying. Um, my computer's starting to freak out. Um, like I just, yeah, give me a minute. D Tiana, you could just try to share and then it'll cut him off and then you can unshare. Okay. I think that'll work. No, I think I do have to unshare. Oh, maybe yeah, maybe. yeah. Maybe Tatsu has the ability to unshare. I'll leave the meeting and come back in. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, what? Alex. Okay. Uh, so I have a, a short optics demo here. Um, I don't have any slides, but I'll drop a reference in the chat uh, after I show this. So the setup here is just an arrangement of right angle prisms. Uh, so it's just eight prisms there uh, arranged with a little gap in the center. Try to line my camera up here. Uh, so I've got a marker. I can put the marker behind and it's a little fuzzy because, you know, they're not super expensive, high quality prisms. Uh, but if I put the marker in the middle, it is cloaked. This arrangement of eight prisms is cloaking uh, that gap in the center. Um, and you can see that it is uh, sort of cloaking and guiding light around it because I can put my hand back here and you can see what's going on behind the markers. So it's not um, simply reflecting out to a different direction. It really is guiding the light from my hand around the markers through that series of prisms and out to the camera. So it's a very simple, relatively inexpensive. Uh, I'm not on a campus right now, so I just ordered eight prisms myself for $45 or something um, to do this demo, actually for a job interview, and I got the job. So there's an endorsement for the demo there. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Uh, so I want to give credit. Um, I did not come up with this demo, uh, so I just dropped a link in the chat. I found this on a blog from a uh, professor at University of North Carolina looking for a cool optics demo to do. Um, so it's a nice sort of gives a flavor of invisibility cloaks, although it's not working on metamaterials, which is uh, a lot of what that research is based on very precisely arranged uh, impurities to affect how scattering is going to work. Uh, but it, because it doesn't work on that, it's just based on total internal reflection. It's also easier to tie in and make contact uh, to your normal topics in introductory physics while still having a bridge to the sort of research area. So that's my demo. That is cool. Thank you so much. Our next demo uh, is going to be from Grant Davis at Virginia Tech. Do we have Grant? I see him, just can't hear him. Yes, I see him. Can you guys hear me now? Yep, there we go. Okay, perfect, perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, piggybacking off the last demo, we also have, uh, this is Tim, by the way, I guess I should hey, introduce him. We're first. from Virginia Tech. We're with the Society of Physics Students. And we also have Hampton here, who is not with us physically, but he is there. He's giving us a nice wave. Um, and we're all students at Virginia Tech. He'll have some words uh, explaining the demo after the fact. Um, but basically, we have another demo with optics um, and also on the theme of invisibility as well. So that's kind of a coincidence. That's it. Move the camera around here. Let's see. Basically, I'll explain the setup really quick. We have a regular beaker, and then we have a smaller beaker on the inside of it. And then the only other material required is going to be some vegetable oil. And then we're going to observe what happens. It's kind of difficult to see what's happening on the inside of the larger beaker right now. But um, yeah, we're trying to adjust the lights so that way. You, the point being, you can still see the small, small beaker inside the large one right now. That's the main thing to take away from this. Uh, yeah, keep going, Valerie. And then we're just going to start pouring vegetable oil in, and then we're going to notice 
Um, we're going to fill that up. And then, so now this smaller beaker is just filled with vegetable oil. And now we're going to keep going. It's going to overflow a little bit. Point being is that as this interface of the vegetable oil is rising, the smaller beaker appears to disappear as if it's not there anymore. Um, Magic. Yeah, seriously. Um, so I think this demo is really cool. Um, it can introduce a lot of concepts in optics. Hampton's going to go through, I guess, maybe why this works more mathematically. Um, yeah, I think this is a great way to kind of introduce um, ideas like Snell's law and refraction. So Hampton, I'll say more about that if he is ready. Uh, thank you, Grant. Thank you, Tim. Great demonstration. So turns out the actual mathematics from Snell's law is up. Uh, fairly simple you know we we as physicists like when things cancel and turns out um this canceling occurs mathematically because the vegetable well i have a diagram right here just so you can see if it's fair it's not as bright as i'd like it to be but here we are so um we have as as more of an idealized diagram on top of a vegetable oil here's what we have on the middle this middle layer is called pyrax you know the pyrax that is um it composes of uh, our beaker and then below that is just another uh, layer of vegetable oil. Now, um, the vegetable oil and the Pyrex have what, have what is known as the same index of refraction. It's just a number we use to quantify, meaning um, how much does light slow down inside of that material. And the second thing that we have to measure has is what's known as your angles of incidence and refraction. And those are usually measured against your horizontal axis. And what happens is, is that since they're um, index of refraction uh, are, are the exact same, it must mean that the angles of incidence and, and, and the angles of refraction are also the same. So the light beam passes through both mediums completely unimpeded. And it's just a very simple relationship here called Snell's law, essentially where um, the refractive index of the Pyrex times the sine of the angle of incidence of refraction, depending on how the light beam in, um, enters the mediums, is equivalent to the index of refraction of the vegetable oil times the sine of the of the angle of incidence of refraction. And because these are the same, the signs cancel out as well. You're just kind of left with theta two being equal to theta one. And we can use various arrangements of this equations to learn a lot about light, to learn a lot about materials, to learn a lot about optics. And in terms of like a classroom setting, um, there's a lot of routes you could take with this. Um, you could take a mathematics route, you could simply just take a, an optics demonstration route, or uh, what I find personally really interesting is the history route, because um, there actually have been multiple attempts to figure out this idea for a very, very, very long time. Humans have been interested in light for about 2000 years, it seems. It goes all the way back to Ptolemy, although he couldn't necessarily derive an accurate mathematical relationship. But then about a thousand years later, in 981, um, a Persian scientist by the name of, um, I think, Ibn Saul um, came up with that. Um, with the actual, the first, well, he actually wrote down the first mathematically uh, correct um, formulation for Snell's law. And then later on, Snell figured it out. And the idea also got bounced around by Fermat and um, Descartes. And, and it actually helped a lot of their intuition for how they developed differential calculus. So there's a, for such a really simple phenomenon, mathematically and physically, there's actually a lot of nuance you can really build off of in a classroom setting. So uh, that's just my piece to give. Uh, I hope you all appreciated that. Um, Grant, thank you again for the great demonstration. Thank you again, Tim. Awesome demonstration and shout out to the SPS, as uh, Rachel has said. Awesome job, guys. Thank you. All right, our next uh, demonstration is going to come from... I'm sorry, Daniela? Daniela, you could just ask the one question that is on the in the chat. What kind of oil did they use? Yes, sorry Canola about that. Oil, uh, soy. Should have been more specific. This is vegetable oil. So uh, specifically vegetable oil and Pyrex glass have the same index of refraction, which is why we can observe this kind of invisibility happening. Okay. So just Thank any you. vegetable oil should work. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and do that? Yes, give me one sec. Certainly. Um, okay. Hope everybody can see this. 
Hey everybody, my name is Chris Martin. I teach physics and AP Physics C here at the Shenandoah Valley Governor's School in beautiful Fishersville, Virginia. I am an alum of the Virginia Tech Physics Department, and today we are going to measure the width of a human hair using only a laser pointer uh, ruler and some measuring tape. So what you're going to need for this is an X-Acto knife, a little bit of cardboard, a laser pointer, some binder clips, a ruler, and some measuring tape. Use the X-Acto knife to cut out a square opening, then take somebody's hair and tape it from one end to the other. For a lot of you, you'll be able to use your own hair, but for others of us that are a bit more follically challenged, uh, we got to use somebody else's. So for this demonstration, my coworker, Lindsay, thanks, Lindsay, <laughs> let me borrow some of her hair. But the joke is on her because I have no intention of ever giving it back. Set the cardboard square in hair so that it is upright. You can use whatever clamps you want. I chose to use some textbooks just to hold it in place. You can use the binder clips as a little stand for your laser pointer and to hold the button down so the laser will stay on as you take your measurements. Use the measuring tape to determine the distance from the hair to the viewing screen. Arrange the laser pointer behind the box so that it shines directly on one of the hairs. As the laser shines on the screen, you see a bright central point right here. Beyond that, you get the old classic diffraction pattern of bright fringes and dark fringes where there's constructive and destructive interference. Use a ruler to measure from the central bright point to the first dark fringe. For this type of interference, we're going to use the equation d sine theta equals n lambda. Here, d represents the width of the hair, ultimately what we're solving for. Theta is the angle to the dark spot. m is called the order number. Which dark spot was it? In our case, we're going to use the first order since I went for the first dark spot. So m is just 1. And lambda is the wavelength of the laser you were using. For most lasers, this is printed on the side. In the example that I just measured, I found a Y value of 4.6 centimeters. That was the distance from my central bright spot to the dark fringe. I found a D value of 7.56 meters or 756 centimeters. That was the distance from the hair to the viewing screen. Now, because my Y value is so much smaller than my D value. We're dealing with some really, really small angle thetas here. So we can use the small angle approximation. This says that the sine theta is about the same thing as theta itself. And it's about the same thing as the tangent of theta for very small angles. That makes it a lot easier because the tangent of theta is simply Y over D. So it's such a small angle, I can replace the sine of theta with y over d. Now all I got to do is solve for d and then just make sure that all of your distance measurements are in the same units. I'm going to convert everything to meters. So I had a distance from the viewing screen of 7.56 meters. My laser pointer says it is 532 nanometers. That'll be 532 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. And then I found a separation from the bright spot to the dark fringe of 0 0.046 meters. And in my case, I found the diameter of the hair to be 8.7 times 10 to the negative fifth meters, which is 87 micrometers. That is about it. And in no time, you're going to have your own students ripping their hair out voluntarily because they want to know how thick it is. Enjoy. Have a great rest of your weekend. That was really cool. I got to do that. Thank you, Tatsu, for playing that video. All right, so our next uh, demo presenter is Ryan Fisher from um, CNU. Okay, hi. Um, so I have my camera set up. I know we have over here. Um, so we have a little demonstration here. I don't have so much of the physics written out like a lot of you did, but I'm just going to do some a fun demo showing surface tension. Uh, and so we're just going to do the demo, and I'll, I'll do the classic approach of I'm going to have some of these paper boats that I've cut out with some little notches in them. You might have seen this before, but it's really fun. 
Uh, paper boats we will not just cut out of them. I have a little bowl of soap here with, uh, so they can drop some soap on. I have a tray of water that I've let settle down for a little while. So I'm gonna drop these in and let them float. And then uh, your guess is to predict what's gonna happen to those little boats when I drop a drop of soap into the little hole, right? And now I, they curl up a little sometimes. So that one's not gonna be great, but this one's good. So uh, give you a second to predict. And then there we go. We'll show you another one. Another one already. <laughs> okay. Well, this one should go. Here we go. Okay. So it's like a little speedboat, right? It's a little, little, little jet ski. Now, once I've done one, the other still can work if I get enough detergent, but eventually it'll stop working, right? So eventually you can see I'm not getting much here, even though I'm dropping a lot of soap into this one, right? So, uh, so what's going on there? Okay, so what's going on is you have all these little water molecules and all the water molecules have uh, cohesion to one another, right? They have a force between one another that where they're attracted by hydrogen bonding. So there's forces, but on the surface of the water, you have surface tension because the force is imbalanced. You have a force that's down from cohesion, but nothing pulling up because there's no water molecules on the top to pull up anymore, right? So you have an imbalance. That's what creates the surface tension. When you drop your little paper boat in, which I've now demolished, um, this little paper boat has forces of adhesion between the water molecules and the edges of that cutout there or in the whole edge of the boat. And then the little water molecules are kind of attracted to that surface. Um, what happens then when you drop the soap in is the soap has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic end. The hydrophobic ends try and race away from one, race away from the water and the water molecules race away from those. And the water molecules that are attached to this kind of pull the boat along as they race away. So. Uh, I really have that demonstration. I'll come over to a clean sheet and uh, kind of try and show you that again, but let you see what happens. So I've got some paper confetti now. I made some paper confetti. I'll grab another one of my boats. I hope this one doesn't curl up. Excuse any background noise. I have a four-year-old. Um, so here we go. <laughs> okay, here it goes. And then if, can everybody see that one? Okay, here we go. All right. So there you saw it. Everything just runs away. And what happens is the soap's dissolving and spreading out. And so all the, uh, all the surface tension is getting reduced in the area where the soap molecules are spreading out. The force is greater on the other side and everything pulls away. And you'll see that once you do it too much, it stops working because the soap is dissolved over the whole surface. That's why I need three of these set up. Okay, one more for fun. This one does work sometimes and doesn't work sometimes. Uh, what I have here is I have a boat with a hole cut in the side that a little closer and then I have a spiral so let's see if I can do both of these at once I'm fast all right here we go go back boat oh, that one's going to curl up let's start with a new one okay there we go and close the hole in the side and so it gets pushed kind of sideways and the spiral oh, I was too slow Okay, the spiral, the neat thing is the, the force will get pushed out the hole. And so it will slowly spiral. You're starting to see it spiral here. It's very slow, the spiral. But yeah, you can actually see it's going now. So it'll keep spiraling and spiraling under the same principle. The, the hydrophobic bits are pushing out and the hydrophilic are pulling it along. So there's a little quick, uh, you said for a kitchen demo, that's my best kitchen demo. So thanks. Very nice. Thank you so much. All right. Our um, next. Uh, uh, presenter on our demo series is going to be uh, Kevin Mitchell from uh, Tidewater Community College. Hello. Um, thank you guys so much for letting me present and it's very neat to see all these really cool demos and hear all the presentations today. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, I was challenged by a student to describe a DC motor in class one day because we were talking about Ampere's law and then we got into Faraday's law and it was the essence of a changing magnetic field can produce a current. And, and the student says, well, how in the world does a DC motor work if it's the changing magnetic field that can, that can induce a current? And this isn't exactly the right question, but it sparked an interest into the right demonstration. So. I built a DC motor out of stuff that was laying around the house. So all you need to be able to do this is a, um, some chopsticks, some popsicle sticks, and the hard thing is the magnet wire. So if you get a magnet wire, some chopsticks, and some popsicle sticks, we can use Ampere's law, and we can talk about if we have a, um, a wire, I guess a different color would work better. If we have a wire, if we produce a current in the wire, it's gonna generate a magnetic field. If you start to loop the wire, we can consolidate that magnetic field to push um, 
normal to the uh, circle, the, the loop that we created. And how do we make it so the magnetic field is going to push the uh, motor into a constant rotation? Well, we put it with some permanent magnets. So the permanent magnet is going to work the same way that the electromagnetic, uh, the electromagnet works. It's going to have a north, in, a north pole and a south pole. The north poles are going to want to repel. The south poles are going to want to repel. But a north and a south pole are going to want to attract. So we have to think of a clever way to keep this motor going. If we just have a, a DC current, it's just going to get stuck in some position. So what we want to do is investigate what's called a commutator. A commutator is going to switch our direction of our applied voltage so that we can get a current that changes direction so that when it influences the magnetic field, it's going to be oscillating. It's going to be an alternating, mag or an alternating current so the magnetic field is going to alternate. Yeah, so I have made a video showing the steps that I took to make the motor and then showing the motor working. And we can actually use this to show Faraday's law and get some insight on something about how a guitar works. Let me make sure I'm sharing the sound. All right, so I have my chopstick. I put my chopstick up with a couple of paper clips just to support it, allow it to rotate around an axis. And um, these two stand points right here is going to be where I make my electrical connections. And I'm going to develop a surface for me to wrap my coil of wire around so that I can produce a magnetic field. So we have my coil of wire. I have the two um, pieces of this coil, which I'm going to connect to this pole. I'm going to shave off a little bit so I can make electrical connection. That's going to be my commutator. So you can see if I have the positive end of the battery on one side, the negative end on the other side, the current's going to flow in one direction. Once it rotates um, 180 degrees, the current's going to flow in the opposite direction. That's going to give us that required kick to keep the motor motoring. So we can see that I have a setup. Um, by the way, if you're at home and you want a variable source of voltage, you can take a nine volt battery apart. And a lot of them are six individual uh, quadruple A batteries, 1.5 volts each, 1.5 in series, six of them, 1.5 times six gives you nine volts. So you can have a variable voltage source. I have a um, stack of neodymium uh, magnets. I can change the amount of magnetic field generated by my stationary magnetic field by changing the amount of magnets. I'm gonna show that this can actually give us a variable speed motor. So the first thing is just to get it going. And if I change the voltage applied, I can change the rotational rate. If I change the magnetic field, I can change the rotational rate. I can actually vary the current to the motor with the potentiometer. So I took a guitar apart, got a volume knob off of the guitar, turned it into a potentiometer. Vary the current, varies the rotational rate of the motor. And then how does this work for displaying um, Faraday's law. So we can use this to show how a guitar pickup, we can pick up this alternating magnetic field. Notice it sounds the same. It sounds the same. We're picking up that alternating magnetic field with the pickups in a guitar. That's all the vibrating string does. The vibrating string is going to um, affect the magnetic field. The, um, the coil in the guitar is going to pick up that, turn that um, mechanical wave into an electrical wave. So we're turning this oscillation. We can hear the mechanical oscillation. We're going to pick up the electrical signal, amplify it through the guitar. We get that kind of helicopter airplane sound. And that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was really interesting. Thank you. We're going to finish our demo session uh, with David Wright, also from Tidewater Community College. Uh, David, you're muted. That works now. Okay. There we go. Let me say, we, you saw Leah this morning and Kevin are both very new faculty here at Tidewater Community College. We've got some awesome, a rising generation of awesome physics professors there. So. All right, my two demonstrations today are gonna to be about buoyancy. Two of my favorite, two very, very simple ones to put together. So let me show you how this works. A couple of videos here. 
All right. This is the first one. This is a uh, glass of, uh, of like Sprite or 7-Up, a, a very clear uh, carbonated soda with some chocolate chips in it. And it also works just as well with raisins. Here we go. Call this the chocolate chip motor. Hmm. This is not fake. This is very, you can see the bubbles forming on the chocolate chips. So the idea, of course, is that the bubbles form on the chocolate chips, adding like a life jacket or a PFB to the chocolate chips, reducing their, uh, reducing their, their density, making them more buoyant enough to float to the surface. They get to the surface, of course, some of those bubbles pop. Now the chocolate chip is now more dense than water, more dense than the fluid and sinks back to the bottom. And this will go on for really quite a while. Um, Depending on, the more carbonated the soda, the better. <laughs> you get some very, very fizzy soda. It works really great. Let's say it works with raisins as well. And uh, it's just kind of, I tell my students, it doesn't take much to uh, amuse a physicist. Like sit here and watch this for hours. <laughs> watch, watch the physics happen. <laughs> anyway, so you might try this with your students to be and explain what in the world is going on. Of course, once you get a close up, that's why I did the, the video of this, the close up shows those bubbles forming on that chocolate chip. And the chocolate chips are just slightly more dense than the fluid. So adding a few bubbles or a little life jacket does indeed cause them to float up to the surface. Okay, that's video number one. This next one is a, a less dynamic uh, presentation, but still pretty impressive. Um, this is an egg and uh, this is a, a, a video um, and the egg is, in the middle, whoa, and I give it a, a push with a little spoon there, and wait a minute, it oscillates around the middle? Of course, your students will be really uh, perplexed by this. this. This can't work, how can that be possible? And of course, the, the trick of naturally is that we fool them because this is not all the same fluid. It turns out we, the way we've made this is by taking a very, very saline solution Salty enough so that it's denser than the egg. An egg is just uh, slightly uh, more, more dense than water. Make a very, very salty solution. I had a student once that said they knew when their pickles were in their, had the right saline solution, when an egg would float in the water, they're making the pickles in. <laughs> I know that's, I've never made pickles. I don't know if that's true or not. You get the egg to float in the, in the salt water. You very carefully pour fresh water down the side of the container. Like I, I take a spoon and pour it down the spoon so it just kind of trickles down the side of the container. And so the fresh water, of course, being uh, less dense than the salt water, uh, will uh, uh, not mix easily. Uh, and just sticking that, stick that spoon in there again. But the trick is you gotta take, do some advanced preparation for this because when you first, of course, make the salt water, it's cloudy. You have to wait for the, uh, the uh, cloudiness to go away so the kids can't tell there's two different kinds of fluids in there. It just blows their mind. I'll tell you one quick story. I haven't mentioned this to my colleagues before, but when I uh, first did this trick and some other tricks involving very, very salty water, your best bet is to use non-iodized salt. And um, so it's, uh, I forget what it's called, but you can buy it in big, um, it's called pickling salt. You can buy it in big, like five pound boxes. I bought it online. And I had like three of them sent to my house. And it was unfortunately addressed to my wife. So she bought this, this box and thinks, oh, my husband is so sweet. She's just given me a present. And she opens it up and it's 15 pounds of pickling salt. <laughs> she forgave me about it. I didn't do that on purpose, by the way. Anyway, two of my favorite buoyancy demonstrations. But you got this one in advance. The soda and the chocolate chips or the raisins. Just pour the soda in put in the chocolate chips. In fact, don't do that in advance. It'll all go flat and then it won't work. Okay, <laughs> that's it. And by Thank the way, you, shout David. out to Becca. She was an awesome student too. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, that was our uh, last uh, demonstration in this segment. And so I'm gonna call this session uh, to a close and I'm gonna pass this off. Um, am I gonna send it back to Tatsu or is it gonna go back to Jason? Uh, well, Jason will be uh, making some uh, closing statements. Jason. Um, thank you. I didn't have a uh, grand set of remarks, 
to close, um, but I really appreciate uh, everyone who was able to spend time with us today. Um, the presenters were fantastic. I really uh, enjoy getting to see different people's um, perspectives on what they're doing, what they're trying to do. And uh, the demonstrations, of course, are fantastic. So I really appreciate everyone who was able to participate today. If you um, came to the meeting and didn't present, then uh, don't feel bad. I did the same thing. I didn't present. So um, I'm certainly not going to give you a hard time about that. But we would love to have you consider presenting in the future. Um, we had a few people who expressed some interest in, in presenting this time. And then um, for various reasons, uh, we're not able to or um, I think some of them weren't even here today. Um, and we're hoping to just follow up because uh, we do have meetings twice a year. And uh, one of the things we will be discussing in the business meeting, um, which will start right after this, uh, will be the, uh, the next couple of uh, meetings. So the spring meeting we'll be talking about and we'll at least um, talk a little bit about what next year in the fall would look like. Um, if you can't stay for the business meeting, we definitely understand, uh, but if you'd like to stay, then you're very welcome to. Um, we will be following up afterwards with certificates of attendance for everyone who indicated that they wanted one, which is something you would have done when you registered. Um, if you're not sure if you did that or if you have any questions, you can email me or Elena or Tatsu about that. Um, or you can just wait and see if we follow up with you. <laughs> and um, I think that brings us to a close. So thank you again, everyone who presented. Um, oh, great. Really Attended. was impressed with the, uh, I, I've, I was really concerned when we had our first virtual meeting. <laughs> and with each one since I've thought, oh, this is really fantastic. So I'm looking forward to getting back in person. Um, and that is our plan for the next meeting, but we will not be letting go of the, uh, the online format. We're going to, as we mentioned earlier, try to do a hybrid because uh, we, we can get the best of both worlds if we're, if we're any good at it, so. And with that, uh, I don't know if we have any. Jason, can you announce the tentative date for the spring meeting? So that you tentative date for the spring meeting, I have that the spring meeting is April 2nd at Radford. Please correct me if that's wrong, but I, that's what I have is April 2nd at Radford. I think that's correct, yes. Um, and when, of course, we will have the flyers and, and so forth uh, coming out about it, but for those of you who'd like to at least mark that on your calendars um, so that you have uh, you know, something to uh, count down to. That's how I do it. Um, and I definitely would like to we'll, we'll do at the business meeting uh, is that I will again thank uh, Jim Mugay and Samantha for uh, their assistance with the uh, organizing for this meeting. That's been really fantastic. That's a model I think we're going to try to continue for future meetings is having uh, a few people um, helping to organize each of the uh, each of the meetings, and especially the in-person meetings, we're going to try to draw in a couple of people from the uh, the local area for where we will be meeting. And we're hoping that will help us draw in uh, educators from the region too. So that'll be good. All right, fantastic. Is there something we need to do to uh, start the business meeting other than to say we are starting? Uh, the business meeting will be in a breakout room. Yeah, I think I think we're all set to do that. So if everybody, so people who want to take part in the business room, uh, meeting, please move to the breakout room that is labeled CSAAPD business meeting. Thank um, you. And every all the other all the other breakout rooms will be kept open, so you're free to use them to uh, chat with your friends. Thank you. And also, I did make a, a comment earlier in the chat, and I was hoping to repost it this afternoon, and I forgot to. Um, please look for us if you make use of social media. We do have a Twitter account, um, and we do have a uh, Facebook group. We have not been making a lot of use of them at this point, but I think it's mostly because we haven't been making a lot of use of them at this point. So the more we use them, the more we will use them. Please look for us. We'd love to connect. Make a note. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All the presentations, all the PowerPoints and the presentation should be posted on the website too. So check back when that's. Yeah, ready. definitely, definitely. Um, if you have any, uh, we did have a few messages asking um, for information about the, the uh, presentations. So um, they should all be on the website in short order. And, uh, and uh, we, I think, can follow up saying that those are all 
in place. And if anyone's that's having trouble accessing them, they can contact That them. was very good and informative. Really, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you. hard working, all of you. I mean, that was everyone's credit I should give them. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you. So enjoy your day. I should say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. See you in the breakout Jason, room. I'm sorry. Uh, what's the name of the Facebook group? Oh, that's a good question. Let me find it. <laughs> I think it's um, Chesapeake section of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Yes. Chesapeake section of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Thank you. To my knowledge, I'm the only Jason Sterlace in the world. So if you ever are trying to track any of this stuff, stuff down, you can find me on social media or email or anything like that. And I'll put you in direct contact with anything. So all right, into the business meeting I go. And uh, hope to see some of you in there. <laughs>